Good morning, everyone. We're here to discuss a very important topic in women's health. Essentially, we're talking about self-advocacy and owning your health. Sometimes in life, we're all going to go through a period when we're not going to feel so well and we lose control of our bodies. So what we need to understand is how to navigate the healthcare system in order to get to a point where we feel better and own our health. So with that said, I'd like to start off with you, Ellie. And I think everyone really wants to know what your story is and what does it mean to you when we say own your health? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah? great. Uh, as she said, my name is Ellie Mayday. I am originally from a town of 50 people in Saskatchewan, Canada. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, girls! Oh, I didn't think there'd be anyone from Canada here. Perfect. Um, yes, so very small town, not 50. 50 people. I moved to Vancouver when I was 20 years old in pursuit of being a flight attendant. Um, at that time in my life, I, I was living the dream. I had actually gotten into pinup modeling, lingerie modeling in specific, and I was plus size at the time. Um, in 2013, I was diagnosed with stage 3 ovarian cancer. It was really shocking because I was only 25 years old. Uh, I had searched for it for about, my, my, I had searched for my diagnosis for about two and a half years, and uh, finally I quit work in order to be diagnosed. I said I'm not going back, I'm not stepping foot on that plane again until someone helps me. And two months later I was diagnosed. I had 30,000 people on my Facebook page and I chose to be really public about my diagnosis, about my treatment, about going through menopause at 25, about going through a hysterectomy, three months of chemo, 22 hours of operations, and being happy and enjoying my, the skin that I was in, enjoying my bald head, and just um, being strong for all the people that were looking up to me. If I passed, I felt that I could help one other person by these photos, so I just chose to be really um, public about a disease that not many people are talking about, and because I was so it was so long for me to be uh, diagnosed. I thought maybe I could help someone. So that's my main story. That's why I'm here, still working as a model, talking publicly about my fight with ovarian cancer. Thanks so much for sharing your story with everyone, Ali. I'm sure you've helped a lot of people with telling us about this. So I want to move on to you, Carrie. You've had an experience with migraines for a while. Can you tell us what your personal experience with migraines has been? And what role has that played um, as you being an advocate and how you manage your migraines? Sure. So I have had chronic migraines since I was 11. I'm now 41. Um, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 25, and that's because my doctors didn't believe me. They couldn't see anything wrong, and so I would uh, go to the doctor and they would say I didn't want to go to school, or I had one doctor in college tell me that since I was about to graduate from college, I was looking for something to have meaning in my life. And that was why I was having these symptoms. Um, and so I was diagnosed a few, a few years later, and I learned from all those years of, being, of getting progressively sicker and not knowing why that I had to be the one who was in charge. Um, and I have been writing about migraines since 2005, and I had somebody once ask me, are you a partner in your health care? And I said, no, I'm the director of my health care. Uh, nobody knows my body as well as I do, and I, I don't mean that you know, I don't listen to any of my doctors. I definitely think of them as partners, but I'm the one who's in charge, and I'm the one who has to coordinate all of my care. Um, so I, I don't think I'm finally doing better. I was disabled for about 15 years. Um, I've been finally doing better in the last couple years, and that's because I have been fighting for myself. So I, I wouldn't, well, I certainly wouldn't be on stage. I would probably be in bed if it weren't for self-advocacy. So it sounds like you've been a wonderful self-advocate for yourself, which is commendable. So I want to bring in a physician, Dr. Aviva, into the picture, just to give us some tips as to how to navigate the healthcare system, because sometimes it's difficult to find your voice and effectively communicate to your physician as to what the problem is at hand. So do you have any tips for your patients to ensure them that their concerns are addressed? What can you yeah, so tell I think us? You know, Ellie May and Carrie both have said something really important here, which is that women can go to the doctor's office sometimes for years 
and suffer in silence with symptoms and conditions that are very real. And I have had patients who have had breast cancer who have been told, you know, their doctors seem so busy they didn't even tell them about their, their breast lump. Or women who have struggled with fatigue, busy, active, healthy women who suddenly were like leveled out by fatigue, who spent years being told they were fine, or it was all in their head, or it was just stress, or they're a busy new mom and you know, had a diagnosis of Hashimoto's or another autoimmune disease completely not recognized. And the ability to advocate for ourselves in a system that is inherently biased against women, this is statistically proven over and over again. I mean, just for example, 5,000 more women die in the hospital, they're already in the hospital, of a heart attack each year than men because we're told our chest pain is anxiety, stress, worry, or as Serena Williams was told recently, it's just, you know, you're, you're, not, re you're not getting enough pain medication. And so um, and I really want to emphasize that you have to be an advocate for yourself because it can actually be a matter of life or death for you or for someone else in your family. So some of the things that I recommend in terms of going to a doctor's office, because even for me, I mean, I'm a doctor, I'm a Yale-trained doctor, but if I have to be a patient, mm -hmm. I feel anxiety. I'm already worried if something's going on in my body. I go into the doctor's office and what am I put in? I'm put in a, a, a we call them Johnny's in the hospital, but like an open back, flimsy thing that makes me feel like an infant. Often my doctor is gonna be sitting on a stool that's higher than mine. And so it automatically puts you into this inability to kind of use your voice. And we're already as women taught to be nice and seen and not heard and all these insidious things. So. A few things you can do. One is, before you go into that medical appointment, write down a script. I'm not kidding, like write down every point that you wanna make sure you get communicated and you answer, get an answer for. Then take that script and sit in front of your partner, your friend, somebody, and practice it so that you're really saying those words out loud. Then when you go into your doctor's office, use that script and you can say, I really need to communicate these things and I feel vulnerable. So I'm going to use this script. And that can break down a barrier for your doctor or other care provider, because this can happen with uh, any practitioner in a white coat when you're in that situation. Another thing is bring an advocate with you. If you can't use your voice, or if you're too afraid, or you've had a past experience that's been traumatic, any kind of experience that makes it hard for you to interface with authority, bring an advocate. I recommend actually bringing another woman, because weird things can happen, like if you bring a boyfriend or a husband, um, sometimes a power dynamic happens between them and the doctor, especially if the doctor's a male. So that can be really important too. And, and ultimately, if you can't get the care you need, and it's hard, like you were in a town of 50 people, <clears throat> you might not have gotten the care you needed there. Sometimes you actually have to go to another hospital, another clinic, another doctor, but if you were, if you were hiring someone to decorate your house, and they only did country French and you wanted modern, you're not hiring the right decorator. You're not gonna get what you need. So you have to find the right person. And think of yourself as the client in charge, like you said, not as the patient, but as almost like a customer. And you're hiring them to do a job for you. So those are three big points. Write it out, practice it, write it out, practice it, bring an advocate, and if you need to switch care providers, you don't have to be nice. This is your health and your life. Those are excellent tips for everyone to take heed of. Harry, I wanted to know, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned in becoming a self-advocate? That I know my body better than anybody else. And that's actually taken time, because I think in our society we're taught to, you push through pain, you ignore it, and so that becomes um, second nature. And so I've had to train myself through mindfulness, through just being really, really aware of every minute change in my body to, uh, to know how I'm responding to uh, a treatment, whether it's a medication or acupuncture or whatever, um, and to know if something's changing just, uh, just so I can be aware of maybe what I need to try next. Um, I can tell how bad my migraine attack is going to be based on how sensitive my teeth are. And that's how well I've trained myself. And that has been by far the most valuable thing. Yeah. So I think you bring some good points to light. Essentially, people should know what their baseline is. So if you know what your baseline is, when there is a change, you can let your physician know about it and self-advocate for yourself. So I think that's key. 
And um, Ellie, I believe you've been a wonderful self-advocate. You've shown strength, you've shown courage through everything that you've gone through, and you've been one hell of a woman. And I noticed you <laughs> use that hashtag a lot yes, on social media. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what one hell of a woman means? Yes, so um, I just created this hashtag, one hell of a woman. Ova is kind of giving a nod to my ovarian cancer girls, my teal sisters, uh, mm -hmm. but it's more than just ovarian cancer. It's actually it's talking about the strength that we all embody. I think that every woman is one hell of a woman. So I want to share women's stories and empower each other. I've shared my story, but I'm tired. I'm not tired of telling it, but I feel like I can tell other people's stories, give them a platform. I had a platform when I got diagnosed. I was so lucky to have 30,000 people to tell, hey, I'm about to go through what's going to be the craziest part of my life. You know, what do I do? And I had so many so many people reach out to me, and it was just an incredible uh, avenue. My mom even said one time, like, man, thank God she has that Facebook page. It now has almost half a million people on it, and, you know, it's a community, and I just want to grow that community for um, more than just Ellie Mayday. I want to grow it for everyone, and so I want you to join the page, join the Instagram, help me create this movement that lifts people up and gives them strength, and, you know, we all have this fire inside of us. Let's, let's light it. Let's light it. Woo! <laughs> talking a little bit about something um, else, about self-care. Um, sometimes when we're talking about owning our own health, we need to understand some strategies to take care of ourselves on a daily basis. Can anyone tell me about some of the self-care strategies that you can recommend to incorporate into your daily routine that can really help you own your health? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, I like to wake up early and give myself a good 20 minutes to kind of just figure out how my day is going to go down, to go, get into a good mindset, um, to know what I want to do with my day. You know, I take each day as a gift, you know. Not many people survive ovarian cancer, so um, every day is really a gift to me. Um, I like to go to the gym. I like to talk to different people. I like to brighten someone else's day. A compliment actually means more to me than it does probably to the person that's receiving it. Just find different ways to find joy in your life, you know? It's so, it's, it's so short. We have to enjoy every single day. So that is my tip. <laughs> my self-care is actually kind of self-advocacy in my own life. Um, there's, I spent so much time accommodating other people and not wanting to feel high maintenance, so I didn't ask for what I need. And I was at a, a dinner last night and I had to leave early because I had a migraine. And um, I actually let myself do that. It's taken a lot of time to be able to speak up for myself, but you know, I'll, I'll go to a restaurant with a friend and I'll sit down and I'll say, actually I need to change seats because that light is too bright. Or um, I've now asked my entire family to not wear perfume around me. I ask people to, turn, uh, to blow out scented candles. Like anything that's a trigger, it, it still feels kind of like I'm, I'm imposing, I'm asking for too much, but it's what I need. And if they say no, then I'll leave. Um, so really uh, advocating for myself in all realms is how I take care of myself. Dr. Aviva? Yeah, I would say I think my deepest self-care practice is pay, paying attention to my body. And um, I have a really demanding work life. And uh, it's easy to let sort of the external demands of life drive us to keep pushing ourselves and pushing ourselves when we know we really need to stop. <clears throat> so I'd say the biggest self-care practice for me now is knowing when I need to stop, honoring that, listening to that, and taking some time to replenish myself before I go back. So that balance between pushing and resting is really important to me. Now, I'll continue on with you, Dr. Aviva. Are there any yeah. personal experiences that you've had in your practice that's shaped the way that you've thought about health in general? Anything comes to mind? Um, not so much in my medical practice. I think my midwifery life, because I was a midwife for a really long time before I was an MD, um, putting women at the center um, and really listening to what my, my patients are telling me, um, being more of service than in control, I think that's probably the biggest uh, influence for me. I mean, so many stories of women who have struggled for years being unheard and unseen and felt unseen by healthcare providers. Has, I think that's what I always put front and center is let me hear your story and how is this affecting you on a day-to-day -day basis? Not just what are your symptoms, check, 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 what am I going to do, check, 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 but the human being in front of me. And Carrie, do you have any advice as per some useful strategies on being 
more of an active patient versus a passive patient in your experience? Um, absolutely. Research as much as you can. And uh, when you take that into your provider, don't be adversarial about it. Like, say, I'm interested in this. Um, sometimes doctors can get intimidated when you come in and say, I want to know about this and this and this. Um, so, you know, make it conversational, but also know what you want and know, go into your appointments knowing these are the things I want to try um, and be open to ideas and always ask questions. Take your, make a list of questions beforehand, take it with you and always ask, make sure you get all of your questions answered, which honestly is sometimes hard. So I actually, I sometimes prior, I, I always prioritize the questions because sometimes the appointment goes on and I realize I don't really need to know that. Um, so it's difficult to, like, I, I'm telling you these, these are the things you need to do, and then I'm also thinking, wait a second, because this is within a system that doesn't allow you often to do these things. Um, so really, I guess, push for yourself, I think, is the, the biggest piece. So we're running out of time, so in the interest of time, we're having our speed round question. So just in one sentence, if you can give the audience your best advice as to how you can be the greatest self-advocate in 2018. Know that your voice matters, that the way you feel about yourself is important, and uh, you know your body best. You do. You know your body best. Give yourself strength to go in and find the answers that you deserve. Uh, mine is you're in charge, and that is, uh, that's a responsibility to, to know everything you feel like you need to know to prepare yourself. Uh, to advocate for yourself, but um, ultimately you're in charge, and so if you are told something that you uh, absolutely disagree with, then you need to speak up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Dr. Yeah, Rebecca? I would say um, don't worry so much about what other people think about you or whether they like you, including your healthcare provider. Um, get what you need from that relationship, and uh, it'll, it can really make a difference in your health and your life. And I'd say just everyone, listen to the signals that your body is telling you. Yeah. And don't be afraid to get a second opinion. If someone keeps telling you, no, that you're OK, and you feel that there's something wrong, you need to push forward and let them know my voice has to be heard. And if you're not going to listen to me, I'll go somewhere else for someone else to listen to me. So I think People that's- People told me I was crazy. People told me I was crazy, that I was feeling it, that I was made up, because I was so young. How dare they, you know? So you went and got that second Absolutely. opinion and pushed forward so yeah. that you can and fight for God, yourself. thank God, I wouldn't be here exactly. if I didn't. Yep. I'm so glad you did that. I'm so glad you shared your story with us. You shared your story with us, Carrie. And Dr. Aviva, you gave us wonderful tips. Thank you so much.